Hi everyone, it's Jerry. Round three from the 41st Chess Olympiad had Bulgaria paired up with Spain. Board one from that match had Bulgaria's Veselin Topala versus Spain's Paco Vieo Pones. Let's have a look at it. This was one of the more exciting games from round three. Exciting games usually follow Topalov. Uh, he kicked off with d4. We have the Dutch by Vieo. c4, knight f6, knight c3, e6. Black is in a position to maybe look to remove a key defender of e4, a square that is a common idea. Uh, having a grip over the e4 square is a common idea out of the Dutch. f4 from just move 1 is already controlling that square, ensuing moves like b6, bishop b7 are uh, also moves to look into on the black side, focusing on e4. So white simply avoids this altogether, this idea of maybe eliminating the knight, a key defender of e4, by playing a3. So he'll have to do something else. Black decides to fianchetto, preparing with g6. Bishop f4, bishop g7, e3. He's outside the pawn chain. He's also watching over e5, which is a key square in this position, as uh, that's where there can be soon a pawn break. We'll have d6 in, and again, this will be a potential pawn break that white has to be on the lookout for. Okay, so following up castles, knight f3, d6, and being aware of this pawn break, e5, will help us to identify the better placement for our light square bishop. Move 8, bishop e2. If bishop d3, keep in mind what risk you may run. If e5, when it has enough support, if e5 is played, do know that a, it does come with tempo, and b, you run the risk of an ensuing fork with the bishop on d3, opposed to e2. So it's a little bit more tame looking, this deployment to e2, but it does address a potential tactic that black may very well have with the e5, e4 advances. Okay, so following up we have h6. Black is in a position to maybe play g5, or look to simply pick up the dark square bishop. So h3, white is in a position to meet g5 with bishop h2, as was played in the game. And let me also point out one other detail. Let's just assume for uh, this purpose that, <clears throat> excuse me, let's just assume that there isn't this idea of a knight for bishop exchange. Let's just say that uh, white castles. Let's, let's allow g5. This bishop on g3, you still kind of don't want him on the g3 square. Again, assuming that there isn't this idea of a knight for bishop exchange, one reason to not still have him on g3 is this type of pawn push, this type of pawn break, which is forcing a capture away from the center, which is now weakening d4, and there may very well be some lines where black could then be crashing through on this square. I've seen those types of tactics before, and it's better placed on the h2 square in short. So, again, uh, that was just a, uh, assuming that there wasn't a knight for bishop exchange idea in place, but um, just regarding pawn structure, the bishop wants to be on h2 rather than g3. So it wasn't castles at this moment, but instead h3, g5, bishop h2, and now black connects knights. Okay, so following up, what do we do? We could castle here, but white isn't castling. Queen c2 instead. Uh, with this move, white is remaining flexible. Keep in mind that there is maybe reasons to not castle. If you castle, you're taking your rook off of h1, of course. Is there a reason to keep the rook on h1? There may be. It's going to certainly keep black a little bit more honest with any ideas of pawn pushes. I'm not saying that this pawn push is one that white really has to fear, but you're certainly going to make black think twice about making that move for as long as this guy remains on h1, since we could have uh, the opening up of the h-file if g4 is played. One other thing, one other way to look at it, is that maybe someday white is going to try to induce some weakness of the f4 square. The move I'm referring to is if this rook is still around on h1, maybe one day there could be h4. 
and you could be sure that black is pretty much going to have to reply g4. You really don't want to allow this rook to have an open file. So a move h4 might very well provoke g4, which is the weakening of the f4 square that the bishop can make use of maybe one day or even a knight. Keeping some options open by keeping the rook on h1, remaining flexible by playing queen to c2. What more is the queen doing from c2? She's watching over e4. That was my initial thought, but she's doing something even more. Applying pressure, looking further up the board on this fifth rank pawn, the f5 pawn. Why is this significant? Well, earlier I was talking about the pawn break that black has, maybe, to be looking forward to. What about white? This is the pawn break, d5. In fact, white already has enough support for it. And this move here would be undermining the e6, f5 structure. If d5 is played, this pawn will have to move or capture. And when that happens, guess what pawn is then weak? The f5 pawn. The queen can maybe pick him up at some point. Okay, so b6, rook to d1. It's opposite the queen. b6 is preparing, of course, a fianchetto. And now king to h8, which was... Kind of tough for me to wrap my head around. I wasn't quite sure what the primary function of that move was. Um, it's certainly getting off of this diagonal. I thought that was the primary reason. Maybe someday um, the queen or the bishop can be causing the king a headache. I guess uh, he's going to be slightly better placed on h8 than g8 when you look at it that way. Um, but... When I looked at it a little bit more, I actually thought the primary reason for that move was actually a waiting move, and one where black simply didn't want to yet uh, commit the bishop to this diagonal. Um, I think if d5 is played right now, this bishop is actually going to be better placed on its home square opposed to being on this long diagonal since after this move again these squares are weakened and I don't know if he really just wants to be staring at this pun um, I think it's better to have him around to watch over these light squares um, that's I can't say for certain of course I don't know uh, the exact thought process that black was going through when uh, he decided on king to h8, but those are nevertheless my uh, my rough thoughts there. It's maybe better placed in anticipation of a weakened diagonal, some checks there, and maybe there's a reason to not yet commit the bishop on this diagonal. Okay, so following up, we do have b4. Notice the delay with this capture, or not the capture, the castling keeping the rook still around on h1, and with b4, there's now maybe an additional pawn break that white could be looking forward to. c5 is already maybe close to happening, since this knight is, again, uh, well, this queen is opposite the rook, so this knight one day could be pinned. If bishop here, this sort of stuff, you can't capture twice on c5. Okay, so this is a, an additional pawn break. This would accentuate the uh, mobility of the h2 bishop if you can crack at that d6 pawn with c5 and again there's also the d5 move okay d5 is in after bishop b7 we have this pawn break and let's see black's response okay it's e5 shuts down this bishop keeps the position closed not wanting to open up this d5 square for the knight not wanting to open up this file for the rook so e5 is quite natural. Knight to d2. Well, why are we repositioning the knight like that? There might be... Well, what is he really doing here? If there's... If you can't get to this square, uh, there's no real cracking at this f5 pawn. Knight to d2 may very well be opening up this possibility, or maybe even something like g4 to soften up the f5 pawn. Making him flinch will mean that you have access to the e4 square. Of course, if you're playing g4, let me just make a passing move. If black were to play a6 here, if g4 is played, there's a little bit of a trade-off here. f4 could be played. Sure, you get e4, but your bishop's now going to have to work that much harder to become activated. This is a very strong pawn formation. 
really negates this dark square bishop. So that could be some little trade-off we could see from here, but I guess he is uh, going to be better placed on d2, looking out for that e4 square. And maybe even knight b3 to d4 is still a possibility if this move is played. Okay, so black strikes at the head of the pawn structure. The position is now going to open up. We have yet to see any captures at this point. Striking at the head of the structure with c6. Um, is there any fear of this capture? Actually, let me back up for a moment right here. Instead of knight move here, if queen takes f5, well, you're running into discovered attacks with knight takes. The queen has to come back. Knight takes c3, queen takes. And there's already some tricks right around the corner with e4. Maybe even first capturing. If bishop takes, there's this double attack. And... If pawn takes, well, there's still going to be this pressure on f3 and the queen. So, okay, we don't grab on f5. In other words, it's, it was knight to d2, c6, takes, takes. And now white finally castles, fully developed. And was there still a moment to capture on f5 right here instead of castling? Well, maybe not so fast because you're dropping g2 at this point. So as soon as... As soon as this capture occurred, the C and D pawns were exchanged, white castles, and meets the threat on G2. Okay, so this pawn is still maybe out there to be taken. There is always this idea of winning the knight. Um, this is, however, something that white, now fully developed, now having a secure king, he goes for it. And with this next move, queen takes F5, we enter a... Uh, we enter an imbalanced position. Queen grabs the pawn and is now going to be won by black, but it comes at a cost, of course. Knight e4. Queen takes rook. Bishop takes. Knight takes knight. So with those last few moves, what has just happened, we have the imbalance of queen versus rook, minor piece, and a pawn. So white is without their queen. There's something you really make you really need to make sure you have if you're without your queen and that is coordination between your pieces white does have that the rooks are well coordinated the knights are connected the bishops have uh, good homes you're not going to cause this bishop any problems and you really can't get at any of the white pieces there's very good harmony on the white side so as a follow-up black is there to defend d6 and now we have rook to d2. So white is doing quite well here. White is the better side. And after after that imbalance, it's not just about the material, but look at look at the structure. The d6 pawn, how he is weak. He's backwards. He needs support by pieces. And there is, of course, um, a king here that is lacking the support of pawns. He is much more vulnerable uh, than the white king, of course. So this is going to be a serious issue here for black. White can continue to improve their pieces, and it's difficult to really even suggest moves here on the black side after this uh, imbalance, after going in for that capture on f5. Um, what might have been better than capturing on f5, or what might have been better than rook to c8? Might have been queen to e7. If you're taking on f5 now, Knight e4, queen takes, bishop takes, knight takes here, there's queen to e6, and it's a more active position for the queen if knight to d5, there's queen here to be putting pressure on the knight. Um, the queen could be, I guess, a little bit more active in this line, playing to e7 instead of the more certainly logical looking move rook to c8 um but okay we simply didn't go down that line we didn't have uh, maybe a slight improvement with queen to e7 instead it was rook to c8 at this point and we do have this uh, follow-up with the imbalance queen versus rook minor piece and pawn but soon it's going to be rook minor piece and two pawns because again this pawn is backwards hit now twice, it's defended twice, but soon there's going to be a third on it. So, rook on f to d1, you can't save that pawn anymore, he's going down, knight takes, 
It's a scary square right here on f5. It comes with check, completely disruptive to the king side position. Bishop takes knight. He needs to go. The rooks are now very active. Rook, uh, rook takes on uh, d6, hitting all these sixth rank squares. And also there's uh, the e5 pawn that is now the next target without the d6 pawn around to defend. So what's tried is queen e7. Just a slow improving move here, allowing for king to h2, flight square, is uh, now back to being available without the bishop on h2. Bishop e8, and now we have uh, white investing some more material. Well, not some more material, but simply investing some material in order to break down the king position, eliminating the knight. King takes, you could rule that out due to knight f5 with the fork. So therefore, queen takes is forced. And now this allows knight to e4, making use of a nice central post. He has ideas of occupying d6. Queen here. You could be grabbing on this square at this point, but first it's knight to d6. Bishop to a4, counterattack against this rook. Both rooks can be captured. White maintains the pieces on the board. He needs to still be around. Uh, white does better with having this rook around it's going to help out with the coordination of the pieces plus you may also view it as still wanting to keep more material on the board since you have the safer king he's going to still be uh, having to worry with bishop checks on this e5 square he there's no color complex that the king can feel secure on for as long as white maintains uh, the bishop pair as well so it's rook to d5 preserving the material entering white's territory you could view it like that as well queen b1 king h2 rook f8 and now he gets pushing he's soon to be a passed pawn bishop b3 and we have a pawn picked up queen c2 the bishop's hit again look at the coordination everything is defended all pieces are defended on the white side white is not inconvenienced at all by being down a queen so black tries to Eliminate a key supporter of this advance. Uh, the pawn can't push maybe as easily without the light square bishop around. If this capture isn't played, I don't even know what move to even suggest on the black side. It's just far too difficult. If we have this exchange and then I honestly, I really don't even know what move to even suggest here. If bishop a4, there's rook check on e7. And... Well, okay, we have moves like bishop to d5. Things get very bad very quick with this bishop pair still around on the board. So black is simply giving up some material to make sure that, okay, maybe he could be finally making use of a light square without getting killed very quickly. So rook takes bishop, pawn takes rook. A couple exchanges. He's now passed, and that's pretty much the plan here for white to simply push the passed pawn. Bishop a4, knight check, king g6. He gets rolling. He can't be taken. If you take with the queen, you end up in a fork. And if you take with the bishop, you end up in back-to-back -back forks with knight to d4. Queen and bishop are hit after queen c4. Now we have rook to e6, another fork, and he will be won soon enough. So, after c6, he's immune from capture h5 and now knight to d4 with tempo on the queen queen c4 and h4 there's other moves you could be playing in fact i think you could still simply push here without fear of capture because of these ideas rook to e6 and then the queen is one um, but there's no rush in this final position here h4 well in, from this position here there's no rush with wanting to push through. h4 is just making sure this bishop will not be kicked from its strong position. Maintaining the post on g3, not running into any h4 ideas, and then wondering, well, where exactly is his next best home going to be now that g3 is controlled? h4 simply eliminates that idea altogether. And after a capture or two, we have a5, rook check, king to f7, Another check, king to g6, and now this pawn is simply one step away from queening, and it's at this point that black simply resigns. Um, these pieces right here 
are close to even having the king in a mating net. This is a, a main problem here for black. The queen is strictly in a defensive position to watch out for c8 equals queen. And uh, just to highlight that idea of a mating attack, there's this idea of e4. There is no queen takes knight because of promotion. There's this idea of e4. I'm just making passing moves here just to highlight the idea. Knight f5. The e4 move is there to have knight f5, and now all of a sudden we have rook g7, which is a mate threat. All of these squares here would be simply covered with the bishop, knight, and rook. So unfortunately, there's not really much that black can do. The queen is tied down again to defending against promotion and this idea of a mating net e4. Knight to f5 ideas with rook g7 to follow are not long off. So pretty uh, exciting game having uh, an imbalance position typical of Topalov. Uh, again, it's at this point that black, black ended up resigning. Uh, just a couple key points in the game that I found when I review these games and I try to take out just little bits and pieces, what exactly is coming to mind? I found these uh, instructive um, just personally for me. Um, well, I was already aware of this bishop e2 idea avoiding potential forks, but certainly be on the lookout for that small idea. You want to make sure the bishop could tuck itself away on h2 in instead of being more vulnerable on the g3 square. This idea of remaining flexible with queen to c2, not yet committing kingside castling. There might be an idea on this h-file. And what more? Well, this was a bit mysterious move again, as I was pointing out. Not quite sure the main intention of that, but it's interesting to see these different flexibility moves with queen to c2. These waiting moves here on the black side with king to h8. The different pawn breaks and this last one here of... Well, really, assessing the position correctly after sacking your queen. We have the material still balance if we go number for number, queen versus rook, bishop, and pawn. But being able to assess it correctly and know that, well, if I'm down my queen, am I going to have peace coordination? Well, certainly white has that, and it was certainly uh, very telling in this game. So, uh, as always, I hope you got something out of this video. Take care. Bye. And if pawn takes bishop, what would follow is first to remove the defender of e7 with knight takes knight, hitting the queen. And after the recapture, you take on this square, and white is clearly...